Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Well, more beer for us. The over in the Everslandy Lara Delvin Rodriguez fight hit. Also, the Golden State Warriors in the fourth quarter came back on the Cleveland Cavaliers, took care of business in game five. Now, let me say this. You need to understand that the opinions expressed here aren't majority opinions. A lot of people who have a lot more experience than I do in analyzing the sport of boxing disagree with me on some foundational issues. There's a good article today. It's on BoxingScene.com, and it quotes HBO's in-house judge, Harold Letterman. And Letterman, of course, believes, and I'll agree with him here, that Canelo, Saul Alvarez, would have no shot against Janady Golovkin. I believe I've said so already online, right? In fact, if you research it a bit, you'll find out that these two men sparred in the past, and Golovkin had the upper hand. But then Letterman continues and says something I strongly disagree with. He says that he feels that Miguel Cotto would have no shot on Golovkin. I beg to differ. I think Cotto is exactly the kind of opponent who would give Golovkin nightmares. I think Cotto would give Golovkin a much better fight than Carl Frotch would, right, at a higher weight class. I understand it's my theory, right? And as I said, it's my theory, it's not conventional wisdom, that Golovkin has a bigger problem against shorter opponents who can move than he does against larger opponents, right? So, just understand, as you watch these videos, that there are differences of opinion among people who look at a lot of fight films, right? Letterman goes further. He believes that Canelo will likely be favored over Cotto. You've got to be kidding me. Right? I'd be surprised if that happened. Maybe it will. That'll show me just how different the public's view is. Canelo's had some tough fights, especially early in fights. One of them involved Cotto's older brother. In other words, Cotto has a family member who almost knocked out Canelo. Revisit the Alfredo Gomez fight. The early rounds of that fight. Canelo looks lost to me in those early rounds. Revisit the Arislandi Lara fight. Now, Lara might be the biggest name on Canelo's resume, who he beat. Right? And my point to you is I thought that Canelo clearly had a problem with movement. If you feel that Lara didn't do enough to win the fight, at least ask yourself why Canelo couldn't even land hard, meaningful punches. This is a guy, after all, with a pretty good jab. Right? I feel since there are tapes like that that show that Canelo has a problem with movement, and since Canelo has had problems defensively in some fights, right? Just look at the beginning of the Floyd Mayweather fight. I don't believe Miguel Cotto against Mayweather looks as methodically beaten as Canelo does, right? I would argue that Cotto, who has won a title in a higher weight class, right? Cotto's the middleweight champion, folks. Uh, a title Canelo's never had. I would argue that Canelo should be the underdog to Miguel Cotto. In any event, when those two guys fight, I'll be taking Cotto in that matchup. So just understand, as you watch HBO and as you trust people like Harold Letterman, just understand there's a different point of view out there. Now, before I get to heavyweight champion Deontay Wilder, let me talk about a fighter who really impressed me this weekend, and that's Jose Pedraza. Right? A lot's happening at 130 pounds. Understand, Rancis Bartholomew, he's left the division. Understand, Terrence Crawford has left the division. Understand Uchiyama, who beat Miura, right? Uchiyama is 35 years old and has recently had major surgery, right? 
Miura is stationary. He's also in his 30s. I believe he would have a problem with movement. Javier Fortuna, to me, is more of an athlete than a craftsman. He throws punches on a loop. Now, that can destabilize guys. Jorge Arce has made an entire career on that strategy. But understand, once you figure out the angles, I think this guy is there to be hit with sniper shots. And understand, Jose Pedraza, who's now one of the champions at 130, has that capability. I thought that this guy, whose nickname is Sniper, is masterful. He's 26. He's one of the better craftsmen in the sport. Right? The guy is a southpaw. He has a three-dimensional game. He throws combinations. He's an advanced combination fighter who knows that when he hits you with certain shots in a combination, he doesn't have to worry about you throwing anything back. Right? Because he knows in the middle of a combination when he tucks an uppercut in and that uppercut lands and he feels it land, he knows you're going to be off balance. He also has the presence of mind to continue the combination, but to not continue it upstairs, to hit you where you're unguarded. You want to keep an eye on this guy. I believe 130 is right for a coup. I think this guy is skilled enough and this guy is young enough to pull it off. You also need to pay very close attention to what's happening with Nicholas Walters, right? Because Walters is going to have to move up a weight class. He might have to deal with some of the guys I'm talking about right here. I'm telling you he would have a problem with Jose Pedraza. Now let's talk about Wilder. Let me say this. And people need to understand my bias. I believe there are a lot of great fighters, or guys who would be great fighters. There's certainly a lot of great athletes in the South, here in the United States. But understand, in the South, football is king. Right? Guys are playing for the University of Alabama more than they are boxing in Alabama. Right? You look around at the level of athlete in the South and you realize, wow, you know, all these guys going to Florida, Florida State, uh, South Carolina, right? If these guys ever put on gloves instead of, you know, football gear, who knows? You know, there's so much talent in that part of the country where Deontay Wilder is from. And let me say this. I understand YouTube tells me a lot of people who watch my videos are from around the globe, right? Canada, Mexico, the United Kingdom. I thank all of you. But I hope you understand the demographics of the United States, right? Understand Wilder is unique, right? His recent title fight against Molina was in Alabama. I believe it's the first heavyweight title fight to take place in Alabama. They pulled more than 9,000 fans. Understand, a lot of people are looking at this guy, and he really does have an opportunity here to change the demographics of boxing. A lot of the fighters you've heard about, right? Mike Tyson, Shannon Briggs, Riddick Bowe, um, they're New York City. Right, Steve Cunningham, Eddie Chambers, uh, Bryant Jennings, Bernard Hopkins, they're Philadelphia, right, in history, Rocky Marciano, Marvelous Marvin Hagler, right, they're Massachusetts slash Boston, Worcester I, hear, Worcester, I hear you, we'll just group everyone in the state of Massachusetts, right, and of course you have countless fighters who came out of Detroit, the Hitman, Emmanuel Stewart, and other parts of the country. But you don't have that history when you talk about places like Alabama, Mississippi, Florida. And it's a little bit shocking given the number of athletes who come out of those areas. Right? So understand, 
Deontay Wilder is a breath of fresh air. He is challenging the balance of power here in the United States. Right? His first title fight, right after he won the title, wasn't in Vegas where he won the title. He took it to Alabama, not Brooklyn, not New York City, not Philly, not Chicago, not Detroit, not, you know, Boston. Right? Boston was where James DeGale and um, and Durrell recently fought. Right? No, he took it to Alabama. So understand, I love the idea of boxing extending its reach. Right? I love the possibility of the South here in the United States actually being a hotbed for boxers, actually having a boxing culture. Let me say this too. I know Wilder has had some personal issues. I'm not talking about the man's actual past. What I'm talking about is his persona and that's also important because it's the persona that young fans see, right? His persona is among the best in boxing, right? When he's not having problems when he's not on YouTube fighting fans, right? Deontay Wilder, when he's in the ring after a fight, gives one of the best shows in boxing, right? After his fight against Eric Molina, he thanked the fans and then he said, you know, I know a lot of you have come a long way, right? He continued talking and he uh, thanked Eric Molina for being a tough opponent Let's say I thought that that was one of the best performances I've seen by a fighter in or out of the ring this year. And, of course, you know what I personally believe. There's the heavyweight title, and then there's everyone else, right? You go around to most people who love boxing, and I think more, more people will know who the heavyweight champion is than any other champion, right? Right? Even when you talk about big name fighters, if I said, hey, tell me who the welterweight champion is, a lot of people will be unable to name one. They'll know of Floyd Mayweather, but they might not be able to put him in the welterweight division. With heavyweights, people know the heavyweights, right? If I say to someone, weight class, Vladimir Klitschko, they're going to say heavyweight. Tyson Fury, they're going to say heavyweight. David Hay, they're going to say heavyweight. Right? I believe the man who wears the crown in the heavyweight division is one of the two most important people in the sport. The other is whoever the pound-for-pound pound champ is at that time. Right? Who the public feels is the pound-for-pound pound champ. Then there's the heavyweight champion. So it's a big crown that Wilder has a part of right now. Right now, you and I, the boxing hardcore, we know there's really ever only one heavyweight champion, right? I mean, as I see it, it's Vladimir Klitschko. Just like when Larry Holmes ruled the roost, it was Larry Holmes, right? I didn't, I didn't deal in lesser titles, right? When Mike Tyson was a champion, it was Mike Tyson, right? Right now, it's Vladimir Klitschko. But Wilder did beat Vermeer Stavern in the ring. He did beat a man who, right, nominally had a share of the heavyweight title, and so he is a champion, at least officially, right? Well, let me say this. As much as I admire Wilder's persona and what he stands for, the idea that he promised the people of Alabama his first match would be in Alabama, his first title defense, and he delivered on that. And the fact that he's the kind of guy who has the kind of charisma who can pull it off, right? He's in a parade in Alabama. He's literally bringing the sport, the heavyweight division at least, to the South, right? Um, just to understand that what he needs to do, and I'm just going to be upfront with this, is he needs to research Vladimir Klitschko's career. He needs to learn from that because right now, even though he's a heavyweight champion, 
there are too many guys out there right now, in my opinion, who would beat the living daylights out of him. Right? Um, they would need to have very skilled medical staff, ringside, if he were to ever fight Tyson Fury, Vladimir Klitschko, or Alexander Povetkin. I'm not talking about all three guys just beating him. I'm talking about all three guys beating him up. Right? If David Hay can stop sending Twitter photos of himself at restaurants, right? And if he gets back in the gym and trains hard, I believe David Hay would beat up his former sparring partner, Deontay Wilder. Right? What Wilder needs to do is he needs to look at Vladimir Klitschko before he was this version of Vladimir Klitschko. Go back to Klitschko against Corey Sanders. You're going to notice that's a different Vladimir Klitschko. Klitschko's always had a big punch. But there, Klitschko, a tall guy, like Wilder, gives away his height. Right? He's leaning forward. He's leaning over his front foot. Right? He's there trying to duke it out with Corey Sanders, whose game was to duke it out. Right? Corey Sanders, big punch. Big KO percentage. You know what he's in the ring to do? He's in the ring trying to knock you out. You're Vladimir Klitschko, better athlete, right? And Wilder is a great athlete. He's thin, not a lot of body fat, right? You know, tall. Vladimir Klitschko, at the time, thin, not a lot of body fat, tall, right? Gave away his height. Tried to be on his front foot against even front foot types, right? Guys who are trying to be bad drivers, trying to cause car crashes for you. This guy's in front of him. He had a great jab, didn't really use it enough. Vladimir Klitschko gets drilled several times by Corey Sanders. Again, you need to look at that fight. He goes down. He's KO. Understand, Vladimir Klitschko later gets beaten up again in a fight he's dominating. But the fight, he couldn't control the pacing. It's against Lehman Brewster. Right? He's beating up Brewster. But guess what? He's so badly paced that he literally falls apart in the middle of the fight. Gets stopped. Right? Falls on the canvas. Later would claim that he thought he was drugged. It's later that he figures out that he needs to change his game. That he gets with Emmanuel Stewart. Stewart actually convinces Klitschko that he's tall, that he can fight tall, that that great jab he has, he can use that for timing, for distance, for pacing. He actually convinces Klitschko to take fights in stages. He doesn't have to show up and try to have a shootout early in a fight like he did against Corey Sanders. He can actually show up, use a jab. If the guy is open for a left hook, he never has to throw his right hand. Right? So he's fighting Ray Austin. Hits him with jabs. Hits him with left hooks. Ray Austin can't handle the left hook. We never see the right hand. Suddenly, guys are backing away from Vladimir Klitschko. Understand, Klitschko's chin is still an uncertain commodity. He gets drilled by Sam Peter. Knocked down multiple times in that fight. But when he gets up, he gets back to his jab. Sam Peter, a shorter fighter, who's a Corey Sanders type, big punch, right? Is, is trying to get in a car accident with you, right? Sam Peter never gets close enough to him to get in that car accident. Now here I'm looking at Deontay Wilder, and Deontay Wilder looks so raw to me. He looks so green to me. He looks like younger Vladimir Klitschko. He looks like he's headed for car crashes. Let me tell you, he starts the fight, he's flat-footed. He's bent over. Why would a 6'7 guy with a jab give up his height? You're going to have to explain that to me. Let me say this too. I watched the fight. I was looking at that jab. I was keying on that jab. Now, I don't know where CompuBots got their numbers. 
because I didn't see Deontay Wilder throw that jab that much. He certainly didn't throw it authoritatively. Right? I want you to look at Eric Molina's face. You know when a guy is popping a great jab. The guy's face gets busted up. Right? The guy, you know, the guy has a swollen eye. The guy, you know, that's not the case here. Deontay Wilder, who has a jab, right, um, doesn't know when to throw it. Right? Really doesn't. Now, I'll say this. As raw as he looked to me, he's improving, right? You know my statement on Deontay Wilder. I believe he's really just a long right hand, right? Here, I'll concede the first knockdown is a very nice left. I'll concede that. But let me tell you where he's still really raw, right? Defensively, it almost looks hopeless. The third round, Eric Molina steps forward, right? Keep in mind, up until this point, Molina's been back. He steps forward. I want you to look at Deontay Wilder's hands, where they are, right? He doesn't have a hand up, folks. We're not talking about a guy who's a master at leaning. He's not Vitaly Klitschko, right? He's not a guy who's hard to find. He's bent over. He's hunting you. When you hunt him, he's like this. He's as unprotected as I am in this video. Right? Eric Molina really should have ended the show in the third round. He hits Wilder, and let's just say Wilder doesn't know what to do when he's hit. Right? He's not a natural like the Jose Pedraza guy I mentioned earlier who just intuitively knows his way around the ring, who always seems to know distance and timing and stuff. No, Wilder is caught by surprise. Right? He's completely caught by surprise. Let me say this, too. Apart from the first knockdown, and understand, the only reason the first knockdown happens with Wilder's left hand is Molina is so focused on Wilder's right hand, which is all Wilder's thrown with power up until that point, that he leaves himself completely open for the left. Completely open. Right? Well, let me say this. Of course, the rest of the knockdowns are right-handed knockdowns. But even with the other knockdowns, you get to the eighth round. Folks, this is the round before the end of the fight. You get to the eighth round, and you know what? Molina still has a chance to win the fight, right? Wilder hasn't, you know, foreclosed the decision either, right? Because Wilder, while he's dominating the fight, Wilder, excuse me, not the decision, the outcome, right? Wilder's so reckless. And he's so bad at times that even in the eighth round, the eighth, the next to last round, there are moments of that eighth round where he's getting dominated by Molina. And if Molina could have just landed his home run, right? He's trying to land a short uppercut. If he could have just landed his home run punch, the title likely would have changed hands. Let me tell you, too, put me among those, and I understand he gets drilled in the ninth round and he goes down. Put me among those who believes the fight should have continued. Now, I know this is politically incorrect. So it goes. But when there's a fight involving a fighter who has as much of a problem with pacing, who can't keep an opponent on the end of a jab, who can't clinch the opponent when the opponent comes forward to slow him down, to get the pacing back on track, right? When you're dealing with a guy swinging as wildly as Wilder, right, who's as open at times as Wilder, then in my opinion, a referee, when the opponent hits the canvas, 
needs to give that opponent a full opportunity to get off of the canvas, should never wave off the fight early in the camp, should give that opponent an opportunity to get off the canvas because that opponent still has a chance to win the fight. Understand the way I see it. That eighth round that Molina had was almost as good as the third round that Molina had. Right? When a fighter has just had arguably his best round of the fight and he gets caught in the next round and goes down, why wouldn't you give him the full 10 seconds to get up? How do we know that the 10th round wouldn't have been like the 8th round? Right? Keep in mind, too, this is only the second time in his career. The second that Wilder's even gone past, I believe, the fourth round. Think about it. Right? The ref waves it off. Molina's a class guy. Molina says, hey, you know, I thank the champ for giving me an opportunity to fight for the title. Okay, fine. From my seat, I was thinking, what a shame. Because Molina had gotten off the canvas before and was giving Wilder all he could handle. Right. I didn't get the feeling, you know, the Pedraza fight against Klimov. You're watching that fight, and by the ninth round, you're thinking, oh, man, this is a mismatch. Pedraza has busted up the other guy, is, you know, doing boxing moves. It's not getting hit. It's looking good. He's like going, <laughs> you know, not getting hit. And you say, oh, he's in control. Now, that fight. If Pedraza had knocked down Klimov, you know, if the ref waves it off, I'd say, okay, well, my scorecard has Pedraza dominating the fight. And the last few rounds, he's been dominating the fight. I don't see the opponent doing enough for me to think that this fight still hangs in the balance. Right? I didn't get that feeling in the Wilder fight. Right, the Wilder fight, I thought, oh, man, you know, Molina's still alive. <laughs> I saw the eighth round. I thought, oh, man, you know, he's so close to landing his punch that if this guy just gets an extra step, you know, he might, he might stop Wilder. So, of course, after the fight, as you can imagine, Tom, Dick, and Harry, my next-door neighbor, your next-door neighbor, guys like David Price, they're saying, hey, I wasn't impressed. Lucas Brown. They're saying, hey, I wasn't impressed. You know, I'll take on Wilder. Hey, Deontay, here's my number. Call me, please. Now, David Price, I don't know about. Because Price looked really bad to me against Tony Thompson. Price has some issues against guys with good jabs who know what they're doing in the ring. But, yeah, I wouldn't hesitate to take Lucas Brown against Deontay Wilder. Right, so understand, if I'm Wilder, I continue to listen to my corner. I look at the film. I compare and contrast what I'm doing in giving away six foot seven inches of height the way a younger Vladimir Klitschko did. And I have to ask myself, how did Klitschko correct his problems? I would take out a bunch of Klitschko tapes, right, because... Sometimes guys get the title when they're at the zenith of their careers. Other times, guys get the belt a little bit too early, when they're still green, when they aren't quite ready for elite competition. I believe that's where Wilder is right now. I don't know how his corner is going to do it. But I don't believe this young man is ready to fight Alexander Povetkin, his mandatory contender, Lucas Brown. I mean, if I were him, I wouldn't answer the phone when Lucas Brown calls. I'd be like, not now, maybe in a year or two, but ooh, ooh, not now, right? Um, you know, let me say, too, Wilder can knock anyone down. His long right hand is one of the best punches in boxing. He has the KO ratio he has, right? It's better than 90%. Only one guy has gone the distance against him. 
for a reason. The problem, though, is you just saw Eric Molina get off the canvas multiple times. And I'm telling you, he wins the eighth round. Right? Wilder looks tired to me. Wilder looks almost as spent as Vladimir Klitschko did when he lost his title to Lehman Brewster. Right? So, there's work to be done. I believe Wilder's portion of the heavyweight title is in jeopardy, just like I believe Vladimir Klitschko's is if he fights Tyson Fury. Right? Pay close attention to the heavyweight division. A lot is going on. The titles are in doubt. A lot of people are going to pick up the paper. They're going to see Deontay Wilder wins by KO. And they're going to say, wow, this guy has a nice KO percentage. Right? This is yet another fight where he's shown dominance. If you look at the film, you're going to see that he's showing flaws, especially defensively. Right? He's a tall guy who hasn't had to move his head much. There's certain skills that certain heavyweights, Andy Ruiz, remember that name, have in terms of rolling with punches and getting a shoulder somehow between you and his head, right? That Deontay Wilder hasn't developed, right? I'm telling you, the waters are too deep for a guy like this to fight real heavyweight competition not Eric Molina who lost to Chris Ariola but yet somehow gets a title shot but against real competition right Chris Ariola even right there too many guys out there for this guy to continue to hold on to the heavyweight title unless he lifts his game that's how I see it let me hear from you Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.